On this Saturday night, the fight for migrant workers in Canada. Are their labor rights being neglected during this health crisis? Beijing tells Ottawa to butt out after Canada suspends its extradition treaty with Hong Kong. Plus, subdued celebrations this July 4th weekend as another person in the president's inner circle tests positive for COVID-19. Oh, we don't appreciate a bunch of yeah. coming here and trying to take our jobs. And the cabbie who had to listen to this while asking a fare to wear a mask. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin tonight with a call to action across this country to protect migrant workers and other non-permanent residents. Protests took place in several cities, demanding the federal government do more to help temporary foreign workers, international students and refugees. Many of them have been on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. They've been doing work deemed as essential, but protesters say the Canadian government is failing them. David Aiken reports. They gathered in Montreal, in Richmond, B.C., and in Toronto. I'm out here today, please asking that we get full immigration status now. Full immigration status will mean better health protection and labor rights for temporary foreign workers, refugees and international students. We are talking about over a million and a half people. One in 23 people in this country are either temporary or undocumented. Activists say the pandemic has highlighted how vulnerable this group is. In the last week, there has been a particular focus on temporary foreign workers in the agricultural sector, mostly in Ontario, Quebec and B.C. Essex County in southwestern Ontario has been the hotspot of a recent health crisis. The Windsor-Essex County Health Unit says 688 farm workers there have COVID-19, including 191 on one farm alone. Ontario Premier Doug Ford dispatched emergency management personnel to deal with the outbreak and to make sure farms can keep producing food. Food is critical. And we're, we're going to get over this. We're going to get it resolved because everyone's working together and it's, it's no, one's, no one's fault. It's, it's this COVID-19 came in there and, and we're, we're locking it down. And while activists have been pushing for better conditions for the 50,000 or so migrant farm workers, they say the half a million temporary foreign workers in other sectors also need protection. These are essential workers, from the construction worker to the cleaner, to the Uber driver, to the healthcare worker, to the farm worker, to the domestic worker, to the student, to the warehouse worker. We are essential. We are what sustains Canada and ourselves. The federal government is sympathetic to the cause. We recognize there is more to do to protect temporary foreign workers in Canada. Immigration Minister Marco Mendocino said in a statement, we continue to strengthen inspections and are committed to looking at additional steps we can take. On the street, though, these protesters are pushing for action now. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. Police in Quebec say a fourth person has died following a horrific Canada Day tractor accident southeast of Montreal. The accident had already claimed the lives of three young children, all under the age of seven. Now, one of the two adults listed in critical condition has also died. The victims were among 10 people who were ejected from a tractor while riding in its front loader. A 38-year-old man is charged with criminal negligence causing death and bodily harm. Diplomatic tensions between Ottawa and Beijing show no sign of easing. Yesterday, Canada suspended its extradition treaty with Hong Kong over China's new security law that imposes harsh limits on dissent in Hong Kong. Today, the Chinese embassy in Ottawa accused the federal government of foreign interference. A statement posted on its website reads, Some Western countries, including Canada, have been meddling in Hong Kong affairs under the pretext of human rights which seriously violates international law and basic norms of international relations and fully exposes their double standards on the issues of national security. The strain between Canada and China is one of the topics tomorrow on the West Bloc. We'll speak to a top China security analyst on the case of the two Canadians detained in Beijing and the arrest of Meng Wanzhou in Vancouver. Bonnie Glazer explains why sending Meng back to China could do irreparable harm to this country. Violating this arrangement would be damaging to Canada's reputation. Um, I think that the U.S. and other countries 
would uh, likely view Canada as potentially untrustworthy, and uh, the resulting mistrust would persist regardless of the outcome of the presidential election in the United States uh, in, uh, in November. We'll also be looking at the financial situation here in Canada as the Trudeau government gears up to provide a fiscal snapshot next week. Canada has been spending billions to keep the economy afloat. The 2019-2020 deficit was projected to be $26.6 billion and expected to improve to $11.6 billion by 2024-2025. The parliamentary budget officer is now forecasting a $256 billion deficit for this year. The government is going to have to find a way to walk that line of gradually opening up the economy and turning to the issue uh, of economic recovery. And I say that just because of the inordinate amount of job losses. We've got to get people back to work. We've got to get that unemployment rate down. I'm sitting in for Mercedes Stevenson tomorrow on the West Block, bringing it to you from the West Coast. Please be sure to join us with our special broadcast in Vancouver. Today, Prince Edward Island reported three new cases of COVID-19 for the first time since late April, and they're linked to travel. The province's chief public health officer says the three cases include a woman who works at a senior's home in Charlottetown, who is connected to a man in his 20s who traveled to Nova Scotia and came into contact with someone from the United States. It's Independence Day like no other in America. Many beaches are closed and fireworks have been canceled. In the worst hit country, 33 states are seeing a rise in COVID-19 cases. And despite that, Donald Trump continues to hold holiday rallies where people aren't wearing masks and aren't physically distancing. Jennifer Johnson reports. An Independence Day like never before in the U.S. Fireworks and large celebrations canceled. Beaches from coast to coast closed. In some cases, barricades have been put up to keep people away. I feel that they're unnecessary. I mean, it's open air out here. Boardwalks and bars in several states are also shut down on this busiest weekend of the summer. This is my, my biggest dollar weekend of the year, normally. COVID-19 continues to spread in over 30 states. More than 200,000 Americans have tested positive for the virus since Monday. Florida shattered a new record, over 11,500 new cases in a single day. It's unprecedented, and every single day brings new experiences. Uh, I know it sounds cliche and trite, but that's absolutely the case. While millions of Americans celebrate the 4th of July, local officials are begging them to take precautions. And the biggest thing is just hammering home the message of wear your mask. Some beaches that were allowed to stay open are packed. Myrtle Beach in South Carolina, this one in San Diego, as both states battle rapidly increasing cases. Doctors say there will be a price to pay for all these close gatherings. And we'll see hospitalizations continue to go up. And unfortunately, I think we're also going to see the number of deaths start to rise again. <laughs> The virus is not stopping U.S. President Donald Trump from celebrating the country's independence. Friday night, over 7,000 gathered to cheer him on at Mount Rushmore. His message not about COVID-19, but what he calls a left-wing cultural revolution. In our schools, our newsrooms, even our corporate boardrooms, there is a new far-left fascism that demands absolute allegiance. The people in the audience were all seated close together, few wearing masks. The same is feared in Washington as it holds its annual 4th of July fireworks extravaganza. The mayor has asked people to stay home and watch the event on TV. But President Trump has invited hundreds of his supporters to watch from the South Lawn of the White House. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. A scare for the American president and his inner circle tonight. His top campaign fundraiser, who is also his son's girlfriend, has tested positive for COVID-19. Kimberly Guilfoyle is reportedly asymptomatic. She's the third person in direct contact with President Trump who's contracted COVID-19. Both Guilfoyle and Donald Trump Jr. are now isolating themselves and have canceled all upcoming public events. For months, medical experts around the world have been warning people to wear a mask if they want to stay safe and struggle to stay at least two meters apart. But in the United States, wearing a mask has become a political issue. Even the president refuses to follow the advice of his own coronavirus task force. Reggie Cicchini reports. An everyday piece of protective equipment Respect my rights. has become one of the most divisive issues in America. It's gotten to the point where wearing a mask somehow has become a political statement. 
Health experts, including members of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, have urged people to cover their faces when in public. There's no doubt that wearing masks protects you and gets you to be protected. But not everybody heeds the advice. The fact that Trump is not wearing a mask fits his coalition beautifully. They're strongly anti-government. They're opposed to rules uh, from on high. But playing politics with this pandemic may have cost Americans their lives, all for the sake of not wanting to be told what to do. His supporters are disproportionately male and blue collar. And to them, this is a question of machismo. Are they manly enough to go out without a a mask on. President Trump often charts his own course, but he's faced sharp criticism for a defiant attitude during this health crisis. This is not a confusing issue. We are in a pandemic, and if we want to prevent this pandemic and get people back to work and get kids back to school, people have to put their masks on. Recent rallies held by the president put thousands of people at risk after public health was ignored. No masks in the crowd or on stage. It's his decision whether to wear a mask. In the early months of the pandemic, Trump's decision to go mask free was followed by those who rely on his political magic touch. But as COVID-19 cases spiked, a break in the Republican ranks formed, with many lawmakers appearing in public with their faces covered. President Trump is now the odd man out. If he were to do that simple thing, it would really encourage people to actually do the right thing. There's a strong partisan divide when wearing masks. Seven in ten Democrats say they wear a mask when outdoors or in stores, compared to 56 percent of Republicans. Overall, 65 percent of all adults admit to wearing a mask. Face coverings have now added to the growing divide that exists in America. People simply line up for or against Trump, and that determines the views. The U.S. election is roughly 120 days away, and Trump is struggling in polls. Experts say by covering up his face, the president could uncover public support. Reggie Chikini, Global News, Washington. It's back to business in England for hair salons, restaurants, and most importantly for some, the pubs. It's beautiful just to get back and have a bite. As of 6 a.m. local time, many establishments were finally allowed to reopen their doors for the first time in more than three months. Cinemas, theme parks and churches can also open up, but all businesses must take precautions to prevent the spread of COVID-19. The U.K. suffered the worst hit from the pandemic in Western Europe, with more than 286,000 confirmed cases and more than 44,000 deaths. The Prime Minister welcomed the latest steps to reopen the economy, but warned people to play it safe. We think we're in good shape, but my message is let's not blow it now, folks. We've done a fantastic job so far in bearing down on this disease collectively. Let's not blow it now. Northern Ireland already allowed the pints to be poured starting yesterday. Wales is keeping its pubs and restaurants closed until July 13th, but only reopening for outdoor service at that time. Scotland is opening up for outdoor service on Monday, but customers will have to wait for July 15th for a seat inside. Coming up, the racist abuse this cabbie had to endure and why he's speaking out. In Halifax, video of a verbal attack inside a taxi is getting a lot of attention tonight. The footage shows a passenger hurling racially charged insults at the driver. The passenger has not been charged, but as Alexa McLean reports, both the public and some politicians want to know why. Kuldeep Dana immigrated to Canada from India in 2007. He became a Canadian citizen shortly after and raised his family in Halifax. He's been a taxi driver in the city for more than a decade. Like many, the pandemic has him concerned about workplace safety and says it is what caused him to react when a recent passenger began coughing in his back seat. He scared me, so I just tell him next time when you call a taxi, please wear your mask. Especially in the taxi, there's no not much distance. Masks aren't mandatory in Halifax taxis, but Donna says his request triggered a verbal assault that included racial slurs. He said, you Paki immigrants, you steal our jobs away from us. I'm Canadian, so, and the Canada, they still need immigrants. So, so it hurt, hurt me a lot. 
The exchange was captured on the taxi's camera. The passenger has not been identified. But uh, I have recorded I'm calling the police to you, okay? Go ahead, you call him. Okay. Yes. Who call you, yes. you piece of Yeah, I'm calling now. Donna says when he first contacted police, they told him to simply ignore the man. Donna said he had video proof of the incident happening and insisted that officers respond to the scene. Officers attended and investigated and they determined there were no grounds for criminal charges to be laid given the circumstances. St. John, New Brunswick Mayor Don Darling says Donna's story ties in with a motion that aims to make racial discrimination a punishable offense. We're calling on the federal government to make changes to the criminal code of Canada. We're calling on the provincial government to, to use every tool they have uh, to make these types of behaviors illegal. Zana and his family say they want all black, indigenous, and persons of color to feel safe in their environments. So my message is just don't ignore if somebody tells you, just uh, raise your voice. Alexa McLean, Global News, Halifax. Cleveland's Major League Baseball team has made a pitch to change its official name. The name Indians has racist connotations and is considered a slur against Indigenous people. The team says the recent unrest in our community and our country has only underscored the need for us to keep improving as an organization on issues of social justice. Doubling danger still ahead, the dire warning as two health disasters merge. You're watching Global National. The COVID-19 pandemic is forcing the World Food Program to launch its biggest humanitarian response in history. The United Nations Agency fears 270 million people could be acutely food insecure before the end of this year. As Redmond Shannon explains, this comes as millions of displaced Syrians are still in need of humanitarian aid. And a warning, this story contains disturbing images. Salwa is five years old, but weighs the same as a newborn baby. In Yemen, her agony is nothing unusual. UNICEF says 2.4 million kids could be malnourished by the end of this year. A war long ignored by much of the world, now made worse by the challenges of a pandemic. It was a massive problem anyway in a country like Yemen, but now there are going to be so many people needing assistance and needing help. In 2019, the World Food Programme helped a record 97 million people worldwide. It says that has risen to 138 million this year, and the number could almost double by the end of 2020. Where we're worrying, though, is that uh, our traditional donors, a lot of them like Canada, like the U United Kingdom, U United States, they're going to be worrying about their own economies in six months. Hunger had been worsened in recent years by conflict and climate. Many of the people at risk this year are in countries where food is not normally an issue. It's the fact that if you're a poor, uh, hard-working taxi driver in an urban slum somewhere and you can't go out to work, you won't get paid, you won't be able to feed your family. In India, internal migrant workers suddenly had to rely on donations when the country went into lockdown. To make matters even worse, locust invasions have destroyed crops in the subcontinent and elsewhere. But some of the greatest suffering continues to be in Syria and among Syrian refugees. Talking about Syrian refugees, about 50% of those that had a job now do not have it anymore. A conference this week looked to plug huge shortfalls in Syrian aid. The total pledge amounts in euro to 6.9 billion. That makes it in US dollars 7.7 .7 billion. That's still less than what the UN says it needs. Aid agencies say the price of food in Syria has skyrocketed and warn that a new refugee crisis from the country could be triggered if the problems there are ignored. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Up next, the first ever report on something uniquely Canadian.
Canadian researchers have uncovered an ancient mine dating back 12,000 years in dark submerged caves near Mexico City. The scientists believe it was used to mine red ochre. The clay-like mineral was prized by prehistoric people and used as body decoration, sun protection and for burials. This discovery may explain how the remains of a young woman who died 13,000 years ago ended up in the cave. There are hundreds of animals unique to our country, but no one has ever created an official list. Until now, that is. As Linda Aylesworth explains, the report is giving one province major bragging rights and major responsibility. Anyone who lives in British Columbia already knows it's special in many ways. One of them pointed out in a report by the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Nobody has ever recorded or cataloged a list of purely Canadian species that are only ours and nowhere else in the world. What makes BC stand out is that we are home to over a third of the country's 308 endemic species. The reason is due in part to some geographical good luck a few tens of thousands of years ago. So during the last glacial period, it's thought that Vancouver Island and Haida Gwaii remained ice-free. And so that allowed species to live there while other areas were covered in ice. So that means they have small populations and they're restricted to very small areas. So that's why these spots have to be protected. 90% of Canada's endemic animal and plant species are vulnerable to extinction. They're not that well understood and the ones that we do know of and have studied are not doing that well because they are very restricted in their populations. And so the goal of the report, which is available on the Nature Conservancy of Canada's website, is to better enable their protection. That's why it's important to identify clearly where they're located so it helps inform levels of government and conservation groups in terms of next steps. Because these species only live here, we have a responsibility to protect them. Um, and, and I do think there's lots we can learn from them. Linda Aylesworth, Global News. And that is Global National for this Saturday. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is mostly Alberta. We would love to see your corner of this country, so email your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you back here tomorrow. Good night.